you know, physicalism is a thesis that goes way beyond the neuroscience in, in very much the same way that dualism and panpsychism is. So I wouldn't just look to the science to settle these things. At the same time, I do appreciate, you know, what you say about the constructive research program of panpsychism. And I'm very much agnostic on whether it's going to pan out. But it is at least interesting to see people like Tononi and Koch and so on taking this very seriously from a neurobiological perspective. Okay, that's, that's got to be more than enough. Open to questions. Let's. You want to field your own questions, David? In general, I think it's bad practice for the speaker to field their questions okay, because well, you don't. Uh, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of biases. Your and, hand yeah. first, and then Jesse. And yeah. then I'll come over here. To yeah. Martina. So, 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 two quick comments. One, it's not so clear to me that the type A, type B materialists are as distinct as you say that they are. There, I don't. I don't really recognize that as, if you like, a tension between those two views. It seems to me that if you're going to be a type B, you need to motivate it somehow. And if you're going to motivate it, it's probably using type A kinds of arguments, something like that. So, so I, don't, say, well, I, don't, I don't see the tension. Well, you know, you're going to need to say, you're going to say something about why it is that, as it were, you're going to take this proposed, um, this proposed uh, mapping seriously. And the reason you're going to take it seriously is because it reconstructs a lot of the things that we say and do about our own conscious experience. So there seems to be a quite natural relationship between the, between the two views. The, the other thing, the other comment I wanted to make is just that you didn't actually give us any positive reasons for panpsychism there, I think. It's well, still I mean, the kind of council of despair kind of thing, like, you know, we need to not explain it any other way because we buy these other arguments and so maybe we just project it all the way down. It kind of, you know, the fact that some neuroscientists will kind of say it isn't an argument in favour of it. And I'm, I'm a little bit. Sorry, I didn't realise. I didn't realise. I didn't realise there was a request for an argument for it. I'd have very happily given one. Okay. But um, yeah. it's just I don't see any positive reason. Why? Why? So that's just a, a more of a, a request. For it. As as I say, panpsychism is just. In my view, one of the options when it comes to it, theorizing about consciousness. And for me, it's downstream from the anti-materialist arguments, which, you know, there's a whole bunch of other arguments you're going to give, which, for me, militate towards expanding the ontology and introducing either consciousness as a fundamental property or some other properties, such as proto-consciousness, as or neutral properties, as fundamental properties from which consciousness will be constituted. Then the question comes up, where do these properties fit in? to our picture of nature. One of the stories is the dualist story, where they're, uh, where they're you know, kind of floating outside the physical world, and then you've got the problem of interaction. Either they do nothing, weirdly counterintuitive, or they push physical things around, potential tension with physics. Um, and there's also this much more integrated picture, where those fundamental properties are present at the bottom level of the physical world, at a place where many people have thought there is room for something else to be present, namely in constituting the intrinsic structure of the physical world, which science only reveals to us relationally. I mean, that's a point which, of course, any number of philosophers endorsed over the years for reasons quite independent of the mind-body problem. You know, Kant and Rus from Kant and Russell to the contemporary structural realists, the, epi the epistemological structural realists who take this kind of view very seriously. Uh, if you put those two views together, then there's at least this very natural and attractive option, panpsychism, which has the, which has the potential to satisfy many of the theoretical constraints on the mind-body problem, which are very hard to satisfy. You call it a council of despair. I say, no, it's a, it's a potentially beautiful view, which one of the few views which, actually, which can actually satisfy all those heavy, heavy um, theoretical constraints, which turned out to be very hard to satisfy mutually. Isn't it like trying to explain something that is clearly a sort of a, a, a complexity phenomenon? By taking the thing and projecting it back down into its life, I can't quite explain bicycles. I'm going to project bicycleness into every element of the bicycle, and now I've got it. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, we don't need to do this in the case of, of, of bicycles because the theoretical constraints are different. I mean, look, it is a serious problem for panpsychism. How do you actually get the, uh, the complexity from the simplicity? This is a combination problem, which I think may end up being fatal for the view. You know, I'm very, you know, I think it's a very, very serious problem for the view. And I don't say that, you know, panpsychism, look, it is pre-theoretically more natural to say consciousness to be a phenomenon of complexity which is not present at the basic level. So from, you know, the view is certainly revisionary and somewhat radical from that perspective, but, that, but you know, again, following Paul's lead, I I'm not afraid to be, I don't think our pre-theoretical intuitions about what's a phenomenon of complexity and what's a fundamental phenomenon ought to be things which are, 
which uh, are given some absolute weight in our, in our model building. What was the first thing you got? It was about type A and type B. I just thought they weren't really um, yeah. Boy, it's, a lot has got, I mean... I thought they were natural base I mean, it's, I mean I, as I define them, they're very different views in the paper. Basically, the type A and type... The type A view denies a certain kind of epistemic gap between the basic tr between physical truths and all the, all the truths, whereas the type B one acknowledges a kind of epistemic gap and still says it's not an ontological gap. And when I listened to Paul today and a day or two ago, what I heard was things that just sounded type B through and through, which is, look, you don't get a deductive connection from the physical stuff to the, uh, to the phenomenal stuff. You don't get that, you know, I was reading that as, as saying you don't get that kind of transparent explanation. That's too, whole, too high a standard to hold the science to. But nonetheless, there's an identity. So nonetheless, there's no ontological gap. So that was why I was hearing Paul, at least, as type B. And I think Dan is not going to is, you're not going to usually find Dan saying that kind of thing about the, uh, the presence of an epistemic gap. Rather, that will end up being uh, being denied. So those are my reasons for, uh, for, uh, for at least he hearing type B materialism and what Paul has said today. That said, I think you know Paul's views are, are uh, extremely complex and complicated. And it may be actually I mean, you know, one interesting thing is that you, you've been led to be a realist about consciousness by the fact that there is such a smooth reduction from. Uh, the structural features of consciousness potentially to certain structural features of, of neurobiological processes. If it hadn't gone that way, you know, and I think you, know, you guys have acknowledged it, we might have ended up being eliminativists about consciousness instead, who then would have taken the line that, ah, oh, well, we really need to explain here. Uh, the only things that really force ourselves, force themselves on us is needing explaining other relevant, relevant functions. And then we might have had the Churchlandian type A or materialism or Churchlandian or limitivism. So I think there's probably something to your point about there being a there being some slippage between the views. Nonetheless, what I was hearing today had that type B sound. Go ahead, Jesse. Uh, so Dave, as a, as a diehard reductive physicalist, I want to thank you for providing us with such good arguments for our view. Um, it <laughs> seems to me that when you put the emphasis on the argument from explanation, you undercut the dualist and service the, the physicalist quite nicely. I think Paul has what's what's sometimes called, Bill Bettel has called it a heuristic identity theory. So the idea is a theory ain't, earns its keep as, a, as an explanatory theory, as a theory in science, if positing the identities leads to all kinds of fruitful insights, discoveries, and explanations. He also has a kind of detailed isomorphism account about how various aspects of the structure of experience can be related to aspects of the nervous system, things like the, the similarity space we find in color. The dualist side offers nothing of this kind. Positing dualism leads to no further insights and discoveries, offers no structural explanations of similarity space or any of the interesting links between memory and consciousness, attention and consciousness, or any of the other measurable features that we find in experience. Why does consciousness Fade. Why do optical illusions occur under the conditions they do? The nervous system. You're making the same mistake there. That but but so but, but let me let me just finish because so. And I, well, I actually think I'm on his side on that. I think you're wrong about that. So I'm not I'm not saying neuro, you're against neuro, neuroscience. I'm saying by placing an explanation in neuroscience, by placing your theory in neuroscience, you get all this purchase by investing in some fundamental basic something in physics. Forget fundamental physics. I mean, forget uh, dualist physics or, or monist yeah. extended physics. It's like quantum, these quantum freaks. They like say, oh, here's this weird thing in physics. Physics, we don't need physics to get an explanatory theory. It adds absolutely nothing. I mean, I don't think Tononi's theory, by the way, adds anything or has any foundation in science whatsoever. I think it's actually demonstrably false. But, but I think, um, you know, I think when you try and invest in a theory and you see here's, a, here's an approach, here's a mapping that's giving us all this purchase, and say, what are the alternatives? And the alternative is quantum stuff? That looks hopeless. But you know, basic features of the universe that are proto-phenomenal, that's equally hopeless. And then this further thing arises, which is, turns out it's not all about explanation. There is the asymmetry argument. And the asymmetry argument goes that the kind of explanation we get in other fields of science sort of is gap closing in a certain kind of way. But, and I grant that, I, I grant that disanalogy. I want to grant that disanalogy. But, in a way, you've also done the, the materialist bidding because you have an explanation, a wonderful explanation, for why the gap never closes completely. And that's because while concepts of consciousness 
are partially functional and involve all these measurable things. They're partially not. They, they refer in ways that are not entirely descriptive. And to that extent, we have sort of built into our very analysis, the very bit of machinery that you wield, a prediction that physicalist explanation will never be complete. Okay, there's an enormous uh, amount there. But just on the point um, about neuroscience and dualism, I think you said, look, here's the, um, here are the explanatory successes of a certain neuroscientific theory. What does dualism have? Nothing. Dualism is not a scientific theory, nor is physicalism. The philosophical theses. Now, there are some specific neurobiological theories which can be put in the physicalist guise, like, you know, color experiences are identical to such and such, opponent process properties, and so on. And here's a dualist, that's okay. And here's the dualist version of that. Color experiences are directly correlated. Uh, 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 no, no, no. Color experiences are directly correlated with such and such an opponent process. Again, the core neurobiological um, theory here is just neutral on physicalism versus dualism. And that core neurobiological theory is the one that has the explanatory successes. Again, you know, Paul mentioned the other day, the explanatory successes of physicalism. Physicalism doesn't have the explanatory successes. Neuroscience has the explanatory successes. But, but you know, the relevant aspects of neuroscientific theory, at least when it comes to consciousness, are of a character which is more or less neutral on physicalism versus dualism. Um, for panpsychism, look, I don't claim there's any great explanatory successes of panpsychism, yet panpsychism is an underlying fundamental theory that's a speculation. Um, and here we're just trying to map out the, uh, the, relevant, the relevant theoretical territory, but it probably has about as many as physicalism and dualism, which is roughly none. Um, oh, so so I, I, just for clarification, I absolutely don't mean physicalism versus panpsychism. I mean proto-panpsychism positing a fundamental feature of, of reality as the explanation of qualitative experience and specific physicalist theories like Paul's theory or my theory or or Christoph Koch's theory the fact that he thinks it's you know, panpsychism is not panpsychism is not a theory it's a philosophical thesis okay. somebody might develop a scientific theory of the panpsychist guys and you might see for example Tononi's theory or some development of it as a specific quasi-scientific theory, which turns out to be panpsychism. What will do the explanatory work that was not the kind panpsychism, it's going to be the theory. And right now we're still, you know, it's incredibly early days for actually finding the scientific theory of consciousness. Here we're just looking at the broad philosophical baskets that they fall into. So, so Paul's praise was misplaced. You don't have the theory yet, but you're... Yeah. Alas, you know, look, look, I would love to, you know, look, there, there are people here and there who are working on the details, whether it's Tononi. Philip has a couple of cool papers on trying to spell out the details. Look, it's incredibly early days, and all of us should recognize okay. that. Okay, Martin. I'm going to ask a question for both of them, um, which goes on on the relation between philosophy and science that was already in the background um, in the previous comments. Um, as, as you said, dualism, panpsychism, and so on is not a rival scientific theory to neurobiology or something like that. But one might imagine three different kinds of doing bi neurobiology, and I think you think that they are already there. Uh, neurobiology done in a way that there's only functional terminology and stuff like that used uh, in the scientific um, vocabulary. Then one might imagine someone who uses phenomenal concepts, um, acknowledging, for instance, that um, it's a purpose of um, uh, those sciences to explain subjective character. And then one might imagine someone who introduces, postulates, proto-phenomenal properties um, in its scientific vocabulary. Now, I think that your view, as it came out in your comment, would be that let's be pluralists and let's see what the scientific success of those theories is, and then we can have an empirical decision between those theories in the future. Mm -hmm. I believe this is a mistake, and I'm, I'm, I think you believe this too, and I just wanted to see how you can discuss this. I think it's a mistake because in the, in the, ca in the case of consciousness, we have a very specific situation that it's very difficult to s decide what the data are. And that's exactly what we are discussing all the time. Right? It's a substantial philosophical issue to decide what needs to be explained. So science can't ever decide alone which theory is better with respect to explanatory success. And this is why I think well, this is one point. The other point is for the third theory, it will be even more difficult 
um, to decide whether proto-phenomenal properties really explain what we want to be explained, um, as comes up in your famous combination problem, <laughs> um, whether these can in principle explain the occurrence of experiencing subjects, that depends on how we understand experiencing subjects, that's a deep philosophical issue that certainly cannot be resolved by empirical sciences alone. So I think this is a reason why future science, scientific ref, uh, uh, research on, on consciousness must collaborate in a much more deep manner with philosophy because its success cannot be decided without doing philosophy and science in together. Okay, since that's a question for both of us, why doesn't Paul let Paul go first? <laughs> <laughs> Clever so and so. Um, I'll try and give a short answer. I don't think throughout the history of science, when we have cases of new theories explaining some broad realm, I don't think it's true that philosophy has to decide beforehand what the explanandos are. Um, Often the new theory causes us to change our view of what it was we thought needed to be explained. And we embrace the new theory anyway because it gives us a deeper, richer, more successful, more unified, uh, more practically useful uh, control over the target domain. I think that there, there isn't uh, a predefined level of empirical data at which theories need to take aim. I think that our conception of the empirical data is already laden with the theory or the conceptual framework that we were using to describe it uh, beforehand. I think knowledge is theoretical at all levels, Martina. I could be wrong about this, but even our observational vocabulary involves a systematic theory or on top about the nature of reality, and that can change. And what you really want to get is a new global view which integrates the higher levels with the lower levels with the lower, still lower levels. And uh, that's how I would see the situation. So I don't see a crucial role for philosophy, except that I think that philosophy is continuous with science. I don't think there's a cutoff somewhere. The idea that philosophy does deals with a priori matters and science deals with a posteriori matters. I don't like that distinction to begin with. I'm a, I'm a Quinean. In that respect, I'm even a type Q materialist, uh, 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 David. So that would be my answer to the question. I don't see a problem there. So, um, can't come back if you want, but um, I'll, I'll see what I think. Um, like Paul, I'm very suspicious of drawing dichotomies between philosophy and science. A whole lot of science is very heavily, it's quite philosophically invested, <coughs> and you know, many scientific theories go far beyond the uh, just simple you know, expositions of the data with you know, certain kinds of theoretical construction, which involves a lot of reasoning that we might often think of as somewhat philosophical. And I think scientists working on consciousness, you know, there are some people who take phenomenology very seriously in the way in which you and I would. I mentioned Snowdy, there's plenty of others. I think, you know, maybe in some sense they're doing philosophy when they're doing science. I don't think we need to, uh, we need to, uh, we need to decide that question. I think there's a, there could be a whole lot of philosophy in science, there could be a whole lot of science in philosophy. Um, but I do think you're, where I do sympathize with you is the idea that a phenomenological vocabulary or something like it is going to end up being fairly essential in the science of consciousness. And maybe this is a way of bringing out the difference between um, the case of consciousness and other theoretical domains. We want to find a reductive explanation, say, of biological phenomena. You know, when people, for example, explain life or explain the genes in the, or explain, say, something like learning in a reductive framework, they all often end up when doing that, you know, when, when, uh, when looking at things from the reductive level, just not using the higher level. Um, vocabulary, you know, this is this learning or life or gene, and so ah, the concept of gene just fragments in all these ways, and it's easier just to say, ah, well, this is doing this, and this is doing this, and call it what you uh, what you like. Um, and that's, I think, for me, that's uh, that's actually an artifact of the case of transparent of transparent explanation of the f that phenomena. Once you've got these underlying functional processes, ah, given the low-level story, you understand what's going on at the higher level, and you can you can make up your own new vocabulary for it if you want. Whereas in the case of, uh, of consciousness, because of the absence of transparent 
um, entailment there, which is, I think, the situation we're going to be. And you're always going to be left with something like, you're not going to be able to just throw away the phenomenal, the phenomenal vocabulary in favor of the, uh, say, the neurobiological vocabulary here. I think you're, you're going to end up missing something because of the, uh, we're always, you know, got this primary interest in that phenomenological description. Although, you know, again, I'm open to revisionism and, you know, it could be that our whole, there's something very wrong with our whole phenomenological vocabulary and maybe, say, some proto-phenomenological vocabulary or revisionary qualitative vocabulary might end up being the most scientifically powerful way to describe consciousness. But I don't think it'll, you know, it'll be, it'll be quite different from what goes on in these other cases, at least on, in my view. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Andy said that you haven't provided, provided a positive program, David, but I think it's actually much worse than that. You've, you've provided a program for not pursuing positive research of the kind which Keith or I or Dan would want to. It reminds me in a way of Colin McGinn's infamous paper about can we solve the mind-body problem. He ends up at the end of the, that by saying, no, we can't, so now we might as well give up. You seem to be saying, no, we have solved the mind-body problem, so we might as well give up. Um, basically, you've given reasons for not pursuing the kind of research which you know, Keith was describing and Dan would describe this type A materialist approach to the, f to the actual facts of the matter about human beings and the, why, for example, we could transparently deduce if we knew enough about it, that you would give a talk just like you've done today um, and, and, and with, with nothing left over from it. Now, that's going to be a very difficult program, but why should we even pursue it if we accept that actually you know, there's just a brute identity there which is kind of taking, any, you know, any, uh, there's nothing left to, to discuss about it. Oh, it's a blow, it's a blow to the heart to be lumped in with, uh, with Colin McGinn. Um, and I, I felt this actually in reading, uh, in reading uh, Pat's paper as well, uh, in, her, in her book where Pat talks about naysayers. Now, there are the naysayers to, uh, to theories of consciousness and naysayers to neuroscience. I'm not a naysayer. I'm all in favor of positive theories of consciousness. I just don't like your theory. <laughs> You're gonna, I'm saying no to your theory. And I'm saying no to, okay, you know, to your theory and so on. That's not a, that's not a naysayer. I'm all in, favor of, all in favor of neurobiologically based theories of consciousness. Certain physicalist theories of consciousness, yes, I'm, uh, I'm opposed to. But that's how theoretical progress works. You say no to some theories and yes to others. So likewise, to type A, to type a materialism, yes. I reject type A materialism. I think there's room for a lot of other, um, there's a lot of other theoretical programs, which are still positive and constructive research programs, which are not uh, type A materialism. At the same time, I'm actually very open to and interested in type A materialism. I'm not inclined to say that you guys should not pursue your, uh, your projects. I mean, I've, I've done some work myself on, you know, looking at components of the illusionist program and trying to explain the reports. Um, and so on. I don't think it's actually going to pan out to yield a reductive theory of consciousness, but I'm very sympathetic with and interested in people um, who do this. In my book, I told this the great divide in theories of consciousness. If you think that explaining the functions and the reports and so on will explain everything, you'll get one kind of theory. If you don't, then you'll get, you'll get another. And I obviously disagree with someone like Dan on the starting point, but I'm very much interested in those theories. And, and actually, it's been a little bit disappointing that in recent years, there hasn't been so much attention to the type A theories of those kind. When I was growing up in the 80s and, and, and so on, these, these things were, were just you know, left and right. There were far more of these sort of broadly type A theories and other kinds. And oddly, you know, in the last 20 years, the trend has been very much the other way to the point where I'm inclined to think maybe the pendulum has swung a little bit too far to, you know, the hard problem is an important one, but look, I've, I often say that it takes it's going to take some pretty crazy ideas to solve the problem of consciousness, and we should take Dan's crazy ideas as, uh, as seriously as, as, as any of them, that explaining the functions will explain everything, and that it's all an illusion. Look, ultimately, maybe it's a little bit too crazy for me, but look, if it turns out that w in weighing that crazy idea against panpsychism, you end up going the other way, well, you know, more power to you. I want to see the research program developed, and let's see, let's see where they go. Anton, you have a question. Okay, I just want to prepare no, no, for my question. Um, so I want to go and set your argumentation. In the conscious mind, you say you just identify a second, a, sec a secondary intention and a first intention of consciousness. It's a phenomenal field, and uh, uh, that's why there is no entailment uh, from <coughs> non-phenomenal properties to phenomenal properties. But in uh, your uh, paper panpsychism and panprotopsychism you say that protophenomenal conscious protophenomenal properties are not phenomenal and if uh, I accept 
your position of identifying first and secondary uh, intentions of consciousness, I still uh, believe that uh, conceivability argument still works in, 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 in that case. Against? I guess. So, yeah. so uh, what is uh, a value of panpsychism? Because it seems that we just stipulate uh, uh, some additional properties which doesn't want, uh, that doesn't solve any problem because consolability arguments still work. No, it's a, it's a fair comment and it's a very fair worry about panpsychism that you'll still be left with the relevant kinds of explanatory gap and epistemic gap from the bottom level of these theories, the panpsychist level, to the level of consciousness that we know um, and love. I mean, it's got at least, it's got a certain kind of beginning advantage, which is you might say at least gets us into the game. You know, you've got consciousness in the uh, in the picture and which is it's a problem for the for the alter for the physicalist alternatives even to get consciousness into the picture but there still is a question of how you get from the consciousness at the uh, at the bottom level into consciousness at the uh, at the top level and the combination problem is all about articulating that worry I mean, to be honest the more and more the more I've, and more I've thought about the combination problem the harder it's seemed to me we had a conference a couple of years ago on the great barrier reef devoted entirely to the combination problem and my aim was to go into it either solve the problem for once and for all or prove for once and for all that it can't be solved and well we didn't quite do we didn't quite do either but um, but I've come away with the view that it's really a particularly difficult problem um, to solve you know the problem for example of how these subjects of experience can combine to yield new subjects is a very difficult one I think there are some interesting theoretical avenues to pursue which I outline in another paper which I didn't uh, provide in the readings here today on the combination problem for yeah. panpsychism, but you know, but the paper does end up on a somewhat pessimistic tone. I do think this is one of the places where panprotopsychism has a potential advantage. You know, it's actually got this potential advantage precisely due to the fact, which is also one of its weaknesses. We don't know what those proto-phenomenal properties are; <laughs> they're a placeholder. But you know, the problem for the panpsychist properties is you might think we know them too well. There's these properties of consciousness. We can see we know them well enough. This is Martina's view, I know. To, we know them well enough to know that they could not constitute uh, the kinds of properties that we have. Whereas the proto-phenomenal properties, are, since they're unknown enough, they, they, you know, we can be much less confident that, uh, that they don't have what it takes to constitute our consciousness, and it's at least, at least left open. But right now it is, look, it is just an area of logical space which hasn't been ruled out, and it would take, what it would really, turn, what it would really turn on is actually developing a positive pan or neutral monist theory, which is not something that we have that we have right now. So for, in that perspective, all this is speculative. But if it turns out there's an area of logical space that's not ruled out, well, hey, that's a big plus, because at least by my views, by my view, a whole lot of the other areas of logical space are just, are just ruled out. Which again is not to say that people shouldn't be pursuing them, because I might be wrong. Yeah. I, I've been biting my tongue. <laughs> and uh, good thing I did, because Andy and Jesse and Paul and Nick have all said things that I want to endorse and that saves me from saying them. I say here, thank you all for points that I want, wanted to make anyway. But there's one that, that I think I have to address and that is, I'm going to respond to a remark by Martina when she said, it's so hard to know what the data are here. And I agree entirely with you on that and that is why I went to all the trouble of creating heterophenomenology which is explicitly neutral about the metaphysical status of the data and it, it goes out of its way to say any scientific project you're going to call it th third person absolutism this is the third person absolutism of not scientific theories, but of scientific investigation. And heterophenomenology is a method which goes from people's convictions about what they're conscious of, takes the, their statement of conviction as the primary data. Now, there's a good reason for that, and that is they can be wrong, and we wouldn't want to include if they're wrong, then what we have to explain is why they have the wrong conviction, not, not the fantasies that, that, that they propose as the phenomena. Uh, uh, otherwise, and, and if, there's, if there's phenomenal properties that outrun all their convictions, then they're just as inscrutable and unknowable by them as they are to the rest of the world, and we can leave those out. So heterophenomenology is a neutral scientific method for gathering 
what has to be explained. And one way I've put this, and I put it to you, and I put it to other people who, who've objected to heterophenomenology, which by the way has its roots in Husserl, and I say, okay, describe for me an experiment or suite of experiments that's legitimate science and it's about consciousness which doesn't use heterophenomenology as its underlying method. And nobody has yet given me a single example of a scientific research program, and no, not even a single experiment, which doesn't fit within heterophenomenology. Which means, I take it, that heterophenomenology is not biased against the phenomena, it's not, it's not blinkered, and, and also, on this point, I think Paul, Paul and I are on, actually on the same page about where we're going to get the data. And the main difference, if there is one, I think there's, I'm inclined to think there isn't any difference. This is, this is sort of Andy's point. Um, you used the example of DNA and the gene. But that's not an identity. It is, a trans, it is a transparent relationship. It is certainly a scrutable relationship. But nobody wants to talk about an identity there, but they do want to talk about a, an explanatory uh, uh, relationship between them. And I think we're going to get the same thing for consciousness. And we're not going to identify the yeah. qualia with the things that we find in the brain, which are the patterns that shadow the patterns that people report in their heterophenomenology because that would be a sort of similar category mistake. But we will have scrutable explanations for all the data. Okay, uh, just on the, uh, the last point, I'm actually with you that, I think I'm pretty sympathetic with you, that identities aren't really the be all and end all here. What matters is the transparent relationship, and they, those can take many forms. Sometimes they're identity, sometimes it's realization, sometimes it's complicated forms of constitution or just, you know, mechanistic explanation. What matters is the transparent relationship, which I think, which, you know, I think we don't find in the case of consciousness. You do. Paul thinks is not required, or at least that was my reading of the, uh, of the situation. But on, hetero, on heterophenomenology, I mean, heterophenomenology can be read in an extremely neutral way or in a much more committed way. The extremely, you know, neutral, weak reading of heterophenomenology is just, you know, rely on verbal reports for data in the, um, in the science of consciousness. And then it's hard to deny that, you know, boy, at least an awfully large amount of the science of consciousness does precisely this. But that's wishy-washy, and that, that's, that's like a, that would be wishy-washy heterophenomenology, which is not, I think, strong enough for your purposes. Heterophenomenology, strictly so-called, is the view that the reports are the data. Roughly, you know, this is how I understand phenomenology. The making of the verbal reports, those are the data for the science of consciousness. And here there's an alternative view. I don't know what the name for it is. And, you know, autophenomenology, homophenomenology. Autophenomenology. Autophenomenology, which is, no, the data are experiences or observations of experience by conscious subjects. And people report them as they report all kinds of data, but the reports are not the data, they're merely the transmission of the data. And of course that's our attitude towards verbal reports in many fields in science, you know, the, uh, the datum, you, know, you measure the position of the uh, oscilloscope and the datum is something like the, uh, the, the measurement, and then I tell you where the, uh, where, the, where the pointer was, and that's a report of the datum. And I think that's an, a very natural approach to take to the science of consciousness, that the data in a certain sense, you know, the primary data had by the, the relevant observers here who are conscious subjects are the data of experience, which then they can report by a verbal report, but let's not confuse the report with the data. No, I respect the alternative view that the reports are the data, and I certainly understand that given that view, then that makes the uh, uh, physicalist explanation of the data much, much more, more tractable, because if all we've got to do is explain the reports, but, uh, on the other, if you, but if you've got the alternative view, that, uh, which I think is the natural view, which is not to say I can't be wrong, that the experiences um, are the data, or that maybe introspection of the experiences is the data, and the reports are the uh, uh, transmissions of the data, then explaining the reports is not going to explain the data. On the, so look, I, 
I've actually got a, uh, I've got a response to you on this stuff in, I don't know if you it came out in my book, The Character of Consciousness, a couple of years ago. I wrote it afterwards, six or seven pages, really trying to sort through those uh, issues about the two different takes on, on verbal reports. I don't think anybody has, actually, so far, that particular afterword. But um, I do try and go into this and say, furthermore, in the science, I think if you actually look at what goes on in many of the debates within the science, it looks like at least many of the scientists working on this and analyzing experiments on things like unconscious perception, and so on, take this natural attitude that the data, you know, the reports are reports of the data, they're not the data. Uh, well, remember, the reports data. Yeah. Are not, we're not talking about just verbal yeah. reports, we're yeah. talking about everything that's scientifically measurable at the time. Okay, well, yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's all included. In I mean, I'm going I'm, I'm to say, I'm going. Of course, I'm going to say the. Uh, I mean, this hetero. Okay, this heterophenomenology restricted to reports, which I think is the particularly interesting kind of it. And then there's the broad. Yeah, if hetero, if the relevant data here includes all the third person data, of course, I'm going to say the same thing. There are these third person data that we get from measuring behavior and measuring brain, and there are introspective data, and merely cataloging the third person data is an incomplete catalog of the data that need explaining. So I'm going to say the same thing there, but I think the more restricted program of, verbal, of heterophenomenology restricted to verbal reports is in some ways, um, well, look, they're, both, they're both interesting. On the challenge from, um, from to, to find an experiment, of course I'm not going to be able to find an experiment that heterophenomenology can accommodate and the other one can't. They're not, these aren't scientific, scientific views, they're philosophical interpretations of what's going on in the science. The science involves people having experiences, making verbal reports, and so on. And then there's a philosophical take on what's going on in the science. You, know, I, you can certainly take any experiment involving, say, a verbal report that anyone's ever performed and say, OK, the datum here is the, uh, is the report. And there will certainly be some people, certainly in the behaviorist era, era that, that view was extremely popular. And there are still some people who take that view. Today, you can also take the view that um, you know, there are actually data that, experiences, that experiencing subjects are having that they then transmit and they tell us about. Well, I, I guess I haven't communicated what I mean by heterophenomenology very well to you because, what, I, what, because I, think that, I think that's a caricature. What the view you find interesting is yeah. a caricature, and I think, but we, we can go over that. Um, and I don't see, by the way, why, why it isn't an embarrassment to your view that you can't name a kind of experiment which would get at first-person data, experiences, which isn't, which it has to have two criteria. A, it gets at the data that you talk about, the first-person data, and two, it's scientifically respectable. That's all I ask. Give me a single example of a scientifically respectable experiment which is which goes beyond heterophenomenology. Any, I mean, there's any number of experiments that get at first-person data, as I construe them, any number, of, for example, of experiments in psychophysics, which involve, um, you know, I mean, take, 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 take the average psychophysicist's attitude towards a psychophysical experiment. They get the data by performing it on themselves and say, okay, yeah, I'm experiencing this illusion. They have first-person data. They can then tell people about it. Subjects in these experiments, you can certainly, you know, to make it you scientifically respectable, you got to do, you got to do verbal reports. But, you know, on the autophenomenological take, what's going to happen here is these these subjects have these subjects have data of experiences which they're telling us about. I mean, look, what? scientists give serious evidential weight to their own experiences in uh, in these psychophysical situations. Sure, they can report it, and sure, to write up the paper for for a journal, they've got to get a bunch of reports from uh, from That's subjects right. and so on. But they do give their you know they do give their own first person data serious evidential weight. Could I mean can the heterophenomenologist accommodate that? Of course, there's some take on this where you say yeah the uh, I didn't the, uh, the heterophenomenologist. But I, I can I say any experiment can be accommodated by the hetero. Heterophenomenology is just an interpretation of what's going on in the yeah. science. Autophenomenology is another. We shouldn't expect to find an experiment that can't be interpre interpreted one way or that can't well, be interpreted the other. You guys, well, right. once again, somebody needs to seize yeah. control here yeah. since our master of ceremonies has gotten caught up in an argument yeah. uh, involving his own position. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Dan, I now pass it over to you. And I think maybe this session is over, don't you? It's time to go to the bar. <laughs> <laughs>